Okay, this is uh, 1 Samuel 18, actually 17, verse 58. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and to his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of all of Saul's servants. Thus ends the reading. Zach, let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that your servant, Zach, would bring forth your word, your love, and your commitment to us. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, so if you're, uh, if you're visiting with us today, my name is Zach. Uh, I'm the pastor here, and, and uh, we've been going through the book of 1 Samuel pretty much since the beginning of last, or this, this year, since January, with a couple of little, little breaks here and there. But we've been taking a book, and that's what we like to do. We like to go just through Scripture. We take an Old Testament book, uh, we preach through that, and then we take a New Testament book, we preach through that, and we just sort of alternate between the two. And we've been in 1 Samuel, and I have really enjoyed this. Uh, I have been... Personally, for me, my personal study of 1 Samuel has been so rich for me personally as I'm going through it, and I'm seeing things that, that are, 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 you know, that's the beauty of the Bible, is you can read it a thousand times, and it's fresh every time. And so, anyway, I've been really enjoying this, and I've been really looking forward to the point where we get to the story, the, the account of David's life, because he's one of my favorite figures in the Old Testament. He is a, just a, an incredible man. He's very relatable. He's very, uh, just a guy that we can understand. He's waiting for the promise of God that has been given to him. He doesn't know the specifics. He doesn't know how it's going to come about, but he knows that he's been anointed with oil, and he knows that, that the promise that the Lord gave him that someday you will be the king of this land, and yet he, he doesn't try to ever take it for himself, and he could. He's got the people. Like, it already said so right in, the, in the, just this few verses we read already that his, his fame is growing, and people see him as a highly esteemed person, and, and he's a warrior, and he's, he's doing so well, but he's not somebody who's going to look at the throne and be like, that's mine which is what Saul does. Uh, instead, what we see is that David is a guy where the spirit of the Lord is upon him. And if you were here a few weeks ago, again, this, you, cannot, you cannot minimize this thought. This is a huge thought in the Old Testament, and it's only one verse, but it's so, so important. And it said that when he was anointed, that the spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward as if the Lord is going to stay with David throughout his life, which is something that doesn't happen in the Old Testament. He comes momentarily. He, he comes for, for brief moments. And David is sort of this image looking forward of what God intends for you and I through his son, Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus Christ, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, then what we receive is the Holy Spirit, not upon us, but within us from the moment of belief until the end of eternity, which doesn't end. Right? So, so David is a man who's got, he's a man after God's own heart. He's a man who is humble. The spirit of the Lord is resting upon him. And he regularly remembers that God is a saving God. And he's willing to put everything he has on that statement. David is a man of demonstrable faith. Where, where, in other words, when he says he believes something, he not only declares that he believes it verbally, but then he takes the steps to say, here's the proof that I really do believe what, uh, what I say I believe. He doesn't just say the Lord will bring the victory, but then, if you were here last week, he charges headfirst right at Goliath. He doesn't wait. He's not afraid. He looks right at him. And despite whatever children's story or Veggie Tales movie you've seen, he's not like, okay, here we go. He's like, let me at him. And he charges straight at him. That's what scripture says. So David demonstrates faith. Whereas Saul, Saul had that same opportunity. And again, if you were here a few weeks ago, when we talked about the battle, the first battle with the Philistines, David wasn't even in the picture. Uh, there, there's 35,000 Philistines in chariots and horses and then a whole bunch of people on foot that they didn't count. And there's, there's Jonathan. Saul's son, who's just walking with his armor bearer all by themselves saying, let's do it. Let's take him out. 
It might be that the Lord will save us because nothing prevents the Lord from saving by many or by few and they win the day. But while they were doing that, while Jonathan was quietly living out his faith, Saul was on the mountaintop staring at the armies and meeting with priests and getting in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you catch it, church? He's being very religious, but he's not committing anything to faith. He looks faithful, but he's not taking a single step. And I think that's a big warning for us today because I think many of us can find ourselves in that camp where we, we say and do and talk and, and act like we believe, but we're still hanging out on our hill while the army's over there that the Lord wants us to take or that, that trial that, that's coming our way that he wants to give us victory over. And we're over here just saying, bring the ark, bring the priests, let's congregate, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk. Meanwhile, the faithful are saying, hey, let's do it. It might be that the Lord will save because nothing prevents the Lord from saving by many or by few. So you've got David, a demonstrable faith kind of guy. You've got Saul, a guy who only wants you to think he has faith but isn't really willing to put it to feet. And David has just won this tremendous victory. And it's not just a tremendous military victory, although it's huge. This is a massive turning point in their conflict with the Philistines, but it's also a spiritual victory for the, for the kingdom of Israel. I mean, again, let me, let me look at... Let's, let's just real quick jump back into chapter 17... And, and, and remember exactly what David said because David took the field. And remember how the, the Bible says that he was reputed. He had a reputation of being articulate. He was a profound speaker. He was articulate in speech. So he knew how to use the weapons that Goliath was using, which were words. And David turned them right around. And what did he say? He said, we're going to have victory, but that victory has a purpose. And what is the purpose? Well, chapter 17, 46 through 47 says this. So that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And then all this assembly, in other words, the Israelite army, shall know that the Lord does not save with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hands, you, Goliath, he's talking about. The purpose of the victory wasn't just to win a battle. The purpose of the victory was to remind the Israelites who's really in charge, that there's nothing to be afraid of. And he charges head first right at the Philistines, takes out Goliath in one go, and then leads the army into a profound and incredible victory. In other words, it works. It works. God gives David a tremendous victory, and he reminds the armies of Israel once again that our God is a saving God and that nothing will prevent his victory from saving, or for our God from saving by many or by few. Nothing can stop him. Do not lose hope. And because of this, he comes home. He's victorious. He's actually got the head of, the, of Goliath the Philistine in his hands when he meets with Saul. And Saul's like, whose son are you? And, and in that moment, he meets Jonathan. And this is my favorite friendship in the Old Testament. There's so little written about it, but it's so profound and so deep. I love this relationship. This is a godly friendship. And it's going to help David get through some of the most difficult and hard uh, times in his life. Let's read that again. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Souls being knit together. That's the work of God right there. And, and it's verbiage that almost is akin to like a marriage kind of relationship, although it's not that kind of relationship. But there's a moment where Jonathan looks at David and he's like, I get you, man. Like, I love you. Remember, we talked about it last week. Jonathan was the champion of Israel just a few chapters before. He did just what, what uh, David did minus Goliath. Jonathan was the one who led the, the military to victory. And it's reasonable to think that when Goliath came out and said, bring me someone to fight, he's actually calling out Jonathan because Jonathan was the previous champion. And, and yet Saul, who keeps grabbing all the mighty men, he's keeping him real close because Saul does not like when someone else gets the glory. And he was willing to kill his own son because his son got more glory than he did over something as petty as eating honey. And so Saul's got Jonathan close to hip while David's out there taking names. And when David comes back, I think that part of the reason why Jonathan's looking at David and saying, oh, I love this guy, is because he's looking at him, he's like, you and me, we are the same. I wish I could have been out there. My father's got me. And so there they are. This is strong relationship verbiage, but let's look at some of the similarities. Again, their souls are knit together. I think they have common purpose. They have common hearts. They have common desires. Again, we, we look at this and we see that both men, 
are of deep faith and conviction that our God is a saving God, and that there's nothing to be afraid of. Both men are willing to put every single thing they have on the line to prove that faith. Jonathan did it, and the Philistines, he took out 20 guys in half an acre and then crested the hill, saw 35,000 horsemen, and he's like, all right, let's keep going. And then the Lord joins the fight. David looks at Goliath, and for the life of him, he can't figure out why everybody else is scared. And he jumps in, and he says, let's do it. The Lord can save. And he leads a, a nation to victory again, just like that. Both of them are the same in that regard. Both men are men who want to see Israel prevail. Not just because it's their country and it's their friends and family and kings and nation and all that. It's not just that, although, of course, there's, there's a nationalism to it, I'm sure. But no, they have a relationship with God, and God has a desire to see Israel become something that's going to save the whole world. They understand that covenant that God made with Abraham, that, that God would bless Abraham so that through him he would be a blessing to all mankind. Which is why I think David and Jonathan both get the importance of Israel. Both get that it can't be taken out. The Lord is going to protect. There's nothing to fear because the battle belongs to the Lord. They both get that. And both men wish that their nation had as much trust in God as they did. And they're trying to share that with others. I often read the account of Jonathan in the Bible and I kind of think to myself, man, this is a good, good guy. He loves the Lord. He fears the Lord. He, he backs up his faith. He lives it boldly. He does all the same kinds of things that David does. So he's also the prince. Like he's next in line for the throne. And so sometimes I read it and I'm like, God, why didn't you just use Jonathan? He's right there. He's a good guy. He seems to be a man after God's own heart as well. Why not use Jonathan? I mean, he's next in line for the throne. Why did you use David? But I think that there's an element here that's so important that, that, that is easy to miss and that David really does point to Jesus. And when you look at David, what we see is the underdog. And we talked about that again last night, or last week, that God loves a good underdog story. He's constantly writing them. And that God is regularly using the, the unexpected person to accomplish his will. The, 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 the one that you don't see coming. Samuel was someone you didn't see coming. David is somebody you definitely don't see coming. He's not a prince, he's a shepherd. He's not a military warrior. He's a scrapper, a boxer, a guy who, who's, who God has given the testimony and the lessons of how to chase down bears and lions with his bare hands. That's the kind of fighter he is. He's not a tactical military guy. He's, he's, a, he's a justice kind of guy. When he sees a lamb get taken, he pursues the predator. That's the kind of guy he is. He's not thinking about strategy. He's thinking about it's not right that that lamb was taken and I'm going to go get it back. This is not a guy that you would expect should become king. And when Jesus Christ, who is the supreme king of all kings, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, when he came to this world, God didn't give him the parents to raise him in a palace. He gave him parents that were carpenters, a humble mother. He, he, he didn't make him come in royalty, beautiful and covered in garments and that would that cause people to look at him. In fact, Isaiah says there's nothing about him that would draw your eye to him. He's plain, he's ordinary. There's, he's such what you would think of as an underdog if you don't know his true purpose and his true nature. And that's why I think that this is so important. This is why God chose David because God is then, once again demonstrating his character that he tends to use what we don't expect. He tends to, to back the underdog. He tends to be with the person whose heart is fully after him regardless of their social structure, their material wealth, their strength, or their physical attributes. But also, Jonathan's response to David coming in is also indicative of how we as Christians are meant to behave when we think of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Think of this. Look what Jonathan does. Jonathan and David, they make a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And then verse four, Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So they have this covenant friendship. We don't actually know the words of their agreement, but you can kind of infer something by what he does immediately after. He takes off his robe. This is not some normal robe. Remember, he's a prince. Jonathan is the son of the king. This is something that is probably a royal garment. It probably helps people identify him as a prince. And he's taking this off of himself and he's giving it to David. It's not just a present. He's passing a mantle of authority to David. This is more of a, a, a civilian mantle, right? You, don't, you, don't, you wear the robe in the, in the palace. You don't necessarily wear the royal robe out on the battlefield. 
So he's saying, hey, I want people to recognize you belong here. Not only do you belong here, you have my authority. And then he gives him his armor. And if you remember last week, again, a lot of people get this wrong because we, we put these children's stories in our minds and we think of David as this tiny little 10-year-old boy who can't fit in armor. And that's never what the Bible actually said. It says he's not tested the armor. He's not used to fighting in armor. So when Saul gave David his armor, David said, I can't fight in this. I'm not used to it. God didn't give me that testimony. He gave me a testimony of a, uh, somebody who runs, somebody who charges, somebody who fights with their hands. I can't, the armor is going to slow me down. And he, he removes that. He doesn't accept Saul's armor. But when John Jonathan offers him armor. David receives that. And again, this armor is not just armor. Remember, Jonathan commanded a thousand people in their first battle against the, the Philistines. Jonathan's a general. And at least it's, it, it's very reasonable to, to, to believe and understand because historically it's accurate that the leaders of the army generally wore defining characteristic armors, features that would allow the, the, the regular army to look and say, that's the guy in charge. He's the one with the big red feather or whatever. You know, that's why they have them. And they're like, that's the, that's the general. We'll follow that guy. That's the armor that Jonathan is now handing over to David. And this time David accepts it. So it's not just armor, guys. It's not just a present. This is now, here you have the authority to command the military from a prince's um, perspective. Then he gives him his weapons. He says, here's my bow, here's my belt, here's my quiver. But not just that, he hands him his sword. And again, we can, we can get so stuck in sometimes the little chapters and verses that we miss the overall narrative. If you guys remember, again, just a few weeks ago, there's only two swords in all of Israel, Jonathan has one and Saul has one. Now, maybe they've been fighting for a while. Maybe they've started making some more. Maybe they've gotten some relief and the Philistines are allowing them to make swords. But what we do know is the last time the Bible talks about swords, there's only two. Saul's got one. Jonathan's got one. This is that sword. Jonathan is taking one of the most valuable things in his possession, the weapon he has to fight the enemies of the Lord. And he's saying, David, this belongs to you. Go fight the battle. Oh, the humility of Jonathan in this church. Might we be those kinds of people who are that humble? He is so humble in this. He is taking everything that demonstrates his authority and he's giving it and placing it upon David. It reminds me of another wonderful person in, the, in Scripture, but, but another John. But this one we find in the New Testament. He was a powerful prophet and his whole purpose, his whole goal, everything about John the Baptist was to say, I'm not the Christ. I'm here to prepare the way for the Christ. In fact, his sandals, I'm not even worthy to untie or to, to tie them. And, and, and that John, that John would say this when Jesus shows up. A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. This is from John 3, 27 through 30, verse 28. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ. But I've been sent before him. And he who has the bride is the bridegroom. That's Jesus. But the friend of the bridegroom, that's John the Baptist, who stands and hears him, he rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. And then maybe one of the most important verses for us to internalize here. He, Jesus, must increase, but I, Zach, must decrease. Jonathan of Saul has that kind of heart towards David in this passage. Like John the Baptist, Jonathan of Saul understands that his good friend David is going to be accomplishing more for the kingdom and for God's purposes than he himself can do alone. And it actually brings him joy, not fear, not turmoil, to take the authority and the mantle that rests on him and give it to David. It's a joyful act for him. Oh, church, we need friends like this. There's joy in Jonathan for saying, I'm not going to be the king, but I was sent before David. I need to decrease. David's got to increase. And ultimately, we as modern day Christians, this needs to be our role in life too. Not for any man or woman or person, but we need to look and say, I've got to decrease and Christ has to increase in me. And the beauty is that through his Holy Spirit, we still partake in that. We take off that which belongs to us. We place it back on the appropriate person, which is Jesus Christ, the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And then Jesus says, I am now going to live within you. And we become more like him. It's a beautiful, intimate relationship that I think is mirrored by what's going on between Jonathan and David in this passage. 
Church, we need to be friends like this. Friends who don't care who gets the glory so long as God gets the glory. Friends who don't care who's in charge so long as the Holy Spirit is the one that's leading. And, and there's nothing that cannot be accomplished in that kind of friendship. There is no trouble or turmoil or strife that cannot be endured when that is the kind of relationship you have with people. It's the very purpose of the church to draw us together, that we would be one body, one soul, knit together by the, by the commitment to one another and the blood of Jesus Christ. And when we stand together as friendships like this, when no one cares who gets the credit, so long as God gets the credit, there's nothing that you can't accomplish because nothing will prevent the Lord from saving by many or by few. I think another reason why God gave uh, Jonathan and David this relationship is to help David weather some of the trials that are about to come. And there's a lot. Let's keep going. So verse six, now it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel stringing, uh, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, with musical instruments. And so the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Verse eight, watch this. Then Saul was very angry and the, the saying displeased him. And he said, they've ascribed to David 10,000s and to me, they've ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And so, I, so Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from, uh, of God, from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside his house. And so David played music with his hands as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Verse 12, let this land heavily in your mind. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed from Saul. There's some really important things to take note of in that paragraph, church. Really, really important because they, they come with a direct implication to, to many of the ways that we as modern day Americans are trained to think. Right? We don't like fear. It makes us feel weak. But anger... Anger is something that we often actually rally around and say, hey, this is strong. This is good. This is, I can feel strong because of anger. I can, I can even feel righteous in my anger when something's going wrong. And I can be like, oh, that shouldn't be. And I get mad about it, right? But the reality is, is you know, psychologists, counselors, pastors, priests, anybody who does any kind of deep human study on emotion will tell you the same thing. And that's this. Anger almost always is a mask over fear. It's rarely not. There's usually a cause and it's usually because you're afraid and you don't want to feel weak. You want to feel strong. So you're going to change what you feel as fear into anger. And that is a very commonplace thing that you find in even, even secular psychology. And we're going to see, in fact, it's already been said right there in this passage just that we just read. They already called that out. So let's first again look at Saul. And as we've gotten to know him, we've seen a couple of things. He started off as just a kid, a son of his father who was looking for donkeys and then became a king. And the more fame he got, the more glory he got, the more prestige he got, the more he needed it, the more he wanted. And anytime somebody got in the way of his fame, prestige, or, or glory, boy, that just got him so upset. And remember, church, that apart from the Spirit of God, we are far more prone to behave like Saul than we are to behave like David. It's the Spirit of God upon David that allows David to be David. But apart from that, we tend to be Saul's. What is upsetting Saul here? It's the same thing that upset him when his son won a victory over the Philistines a few chapters ago. It's someone else getting more glory than he got. He's upset. Someone else's fame is increasing instead of his. And this is really bothering him. He stayed back while David confidently and very publicly, vocally declared the praises of his Lord and won victory. Saul is sitting there thinking and knowing that should have been me. I should have done that. You see what's happening? It's not only just anger that somebody else did it. There's some self-condemnation, I think, that's happening inside of Saul where he's like, that was the right move. I missed it. I should have. I didn't. And he's heaping judgment upon himself. And I think that causes fear, that causes anxiety, that causes grief, and it causes him to go even further inside of himself because he's striving, he's working from inside himself to try and accomplish these things. And we can't do that, church. We need the Spirit of God. But what makes him mad in this case is he says, they have ascribed to David 10,000s, but to me, they've only ascribed only thousands. 
And then he says this statement. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? Church, that's not a statement of anger. That's a statement of fear. He's saying, he's going to take my kingdom. I don't want to lose my kingdom. This guy's going to take it all. And rather than sound weak and say, oh, I'm so afraid that David's going to take me out. Instead, he's like, I'll be angry. I'll throw spears. I could do that. That makes me look strong. Plus, if I get him, it makes me look accurate. And I'm, yeah. You know, so... Like he's feeling, he's, he's creating fear or fear is being created within him and he's masking it with anger. And we do this all the time, church. What's more is this fear statement of what more can he have but the kingdom? Everybody says they love him. Everybody loves him. Do they love me? Do they love me? I don't think they love me anymore. He just changed something that was positive on both ends. At no point was anybody saying Saul's the bad guy here. Everybody is giving praise to both Saul and David. David is a general and they're saying, hey, great job hiring David, man. You guys are crushing it together. But all Saul can hear is he, they're ascribing more praise to someone else. What more can he have but the kingdom? And then it says he began to eye David from that day forward. In other words, church, this guy is full-blown paranoid now. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like just, just by entering a room that something's out to get you? Or someone's out to get you? Church, that's demonic. You may feel justified in it even. You may feel like, hey, it's important to be safe and I'm just trying to be safe. But guys, to have fear utterly and completely control your lives, so when you walk into a room, your first thought is, how will things come against me in this moment? Boy, that's a prison and that is not a prison that the Lord wants you to walk in. He wants to set you free. Paranoia can become and often is deep slavery. And it is often demonic. And God doesn't want you to be a slave to it. He wants to set you free. And so if you are somebody who, who regularly finds yourself in a position where you're like, everything is out to get me. Everybody's going to destroy me. I'm going to lose all that I have. Boy, God wants to set you free from that. We would love to pray with you. I mean, seriously, after the service, come and pray with us or call the church, make an appointment. We will spend some time. We will talk through that. We will pray through that. But ultimately, it's the Lord that has to provide that victory. But he doesn't want you to live as a slave to fear, as a slave to paranoia. And often another masking of fear is jealousy. So I want to draw our attention to another verse here. And this is pretty interesting. Uh, this one really stood out to me while I was studying it this past week, and I've read it before, I've thought about it before, but this time I was like, wow, this is profound. Verse 10 says this, it happened the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul. That's not the crazy part. We talked about that one before a few weeks ago, but it says, and he prophesied inside the house. Do you hear that, church? Saul prophesied again. It's a bit surprising, isn't it? Like this is one of the gifts that the Lord bestowed upon him the day that he said, you're gonna be my king. He made him a prophet that day, gave him a reputation so that all the people in the land said, is Saul also among the prophets? And from time to time, his spirit would come upon Saul and, and this is one of those times. Now it's the spirit from God and he's prophesying. Church demons don't prophesy. Remember that the enemy has three weapons, lies, deceit, and counterfeit. Okay, they don't prophesy. Now, you might find the word divine, but that's basically finding out what's going on in the here and now. That's not prophecy. Prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not a gift of the enemy. The enemy can counterfeit it, but it's not going to be very good. So this is, make no mistake, this is a spirit from God. This is from heaven. And he's prophesying inside of his house. And if you were here a few weeks ago, we talked about what this distressing spirit is and what it represents. And if you, need, if you want to go over it again, you, know, you can, I guess, check out a sermon online or something like that. But, but basically, here's a, here's a brief, a brief uh, review. The spirit of God, God himself, the person of God, of God, has departed from Saul because Saul has made himself his own idol. He's his own God now. And God said, okay, I reject you. You can be your own God. See if you can save yourself. And so the spirit of God has departed Saul. Now a spirit from God, not God himself, a spirit that God is sending, so an angelic being, which oftentimes in the Old Testament, they can come for all kinds of purposes. Some of them come for war, right? Sodom and Gomorrah, those were angels. So this spirit comes and it's bringing distress, which is essentially judgment. And apart from the person of God present in our lives, all that's left is the judgment 
from God because that's what he has to do if he's righteous and good and pure and requires our righteousness, our goodness, our purity. He has to bring judgment. And so Saul is under the judgment of God now because he's rejected God himself and he's trying to be his own God. And so in the midst of that, God still gives him a gift. And the Lord comes down with a gift of prophecy for a moment in Saul. And it doesn't say what he prophesied, but I have a guess. You can throw this out if you'd like, but here's my guess based on what happens. I think he shows Saul what David would become. And a man of God like Jonathan would see what David would become and rejoice. But a man who has rejected God like Saul would see what David would become and be like, well, what about me? I mean, again, look at it. What is the thing that Saul is most afraid of? Losing his power, losing his prestige, losing his fame. And it's after God gives Saul this spirit of prophecy, this gift of prophecy, that he looks at David and says, I'm going to pin this guy to the wall. There was a time when Saul might have responded well, but he's allowed his, his heart and his soul to sink so far that repentance is so far beyond his mind. His own glory is the only thing he's seeking, and he looks at David now as a rival instead of a gift, which is what he is. He throws two different spears at David. He tries to kill him, but don't worry. We talked about it last week. Again, David is a fighter. That's his reputation. He is a mighty, valiant man, a man of war. He's just not a military guy. He doesn't wear armor, but he knows how to bob and weave. So when the spear comes at him, he's like, whoop, there's one. Oh, another one. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave now. I'll let you calm down. The harp's not working anymore. And so he leaves, right? It gets away. But the root of Saul's anger was always fear. All of this power, all of this anger, all of this pinning spears against the wall, it was always based on fear, not really anger. Why do we know this? Because it says Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him but had departed Saul. Church, I think Saul was probably more angry actually in this moment, less of David and more at God, even though he's done this to himself. How often have you run into somebody who maybe that's their mentality? Their lives are filled with anger, rage, bitterness, but really they're just empty. They just want to come back to the Lord and they are too proud to do it. Don't become that person, church. Pride, pride, pride is what makes you become that person. And the reality is everything that Saul does to destroy David only increases David's reputation. Let's keep going and we'll take the rest of the chapter pretty quickly here. Verse 13, therefore Saul removed him from his presence and made him his captain over a thousand and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all of his ways. And the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he had behaved very wisely, here it is again, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. And then Saul said to David, here's my older daughter, Merib. I will give her to you as a wife. Only be valiant to me and fight the Lord's battle. Now that's what he said to David. This is what he said in his own heart and mind. For Saul, for Saul thought let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. So Saul is presenting one thing because he needs to keep the praise of the people and everybody loves David. So he's like, ah, I love this guy, I love this guy, but secretly he's trying to destroy him. Verse 18, so David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at the time when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the that word, as a wife. Verse 20, now Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David and, as they, and they told Saul and the thing pleased him. And so Saul said, I will give her to him. But why is he giving her to him? Look at his motives. That she may be a snare to him and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David a second time, you should be my son-in-law today. And the Saul commanded his servants, communicate with David secretly and say, look, the king is delight in you. And all his servants love you. Now therefore become the king's son-in-law. So Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David said, does it seem to you a light thing to become the king's son-in-law, seeing that I'm poor and a lightly esteemed man? And the servants of Saul told him, saying, in this manner, David spoke. So once again, church, look at the character of David. This is our character when we are operating under the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. This is what we are designed to be, is like David. What we are tempted to be is like Saul. But David comes at it with this incredible, beautiful humility. 
I mean, we already read the passage. Women are singing his name everywhere he goes. You've killed 10,000. I, I still want to know what that song sounded like. I don't know why, but I picture like the band Queen, like some big rock opera as he's walking through the towns. And, and so he's just like, you know, everywhere he goes, people are singing his name. It says that people love him. He's going in and going out. He's gaining favor with the city. And yet David's response is, who am I? I'm a man of a poor family. I am lightly esteemed. And I don't think he's just saying those words. I think he actually sees himself that way. People are singing songs to him, but unlike Saul, he doesn't care. That's not his focus. It doesn't matter to him. He's just like, I just did what God told me to do. What's the next thing that God is asking me to do? I'll do that next. And people are supporting him and they are praising him and his esteem is rising. But when he views himself, he's like... I'm, I'm nobody. I, I, you know, God told me one day that I would be the king, but I have such high respect and regard and praise for the anointed man of God that God has placed in Saul that I'm never going to try and take that for myself. If the Lord wants me there, the Lord will provide the way and I will be patient and wait. I'm no one. I love the Lord and yet the Lord will use no one to accomplish anything and everything. And that's David's attitude through all of this. And it's beautiful and it's humble and it's wonderful. And you kind of look at him and go, this guy just threw spears at you. Why do you even want to be in his family? And David's like, nah, that's the king. He's anointed from God. This is too much for me to take on. Who am I to even come near it? Let's keep going. So Saul gives Michael, his daughter, as a wife, verse 28. Thus, watch this again, Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Oh, sorry, I jumped ahead too much. There's some really important gross stuff about to happen. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, guys. So David's acting with great humility. Let's jump to verse 25. This is weird stuff. Cultures are fun. Uh, then, then Saul said, okay, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry, but 100 foreskins of Philistines gross, to, uh, to take vengeance on the king's enemy. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So in other words, again, Saul's masking. He's saying, I love this guy publicly, privately. He's like, how can we kill him so that it doesn't look like I'm the one that's doing it? Church, you never have to be afraid, but, you know, and, and you're never called to be paranoid. But people's motives matter, and it's an okay thing to notice. Just don't let it run your life, you know? You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be paranoid. But be weary of people who, on the first go, are just singing your praises and telling you how amazing you are. There's probably something behind it. Uh, let them wait a few months before they make that judgment call, you know? <laughs> so 26, verse 26. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now he's got a task. He's got something to accomplish, right? So now the days have not expired. Therefore David arose and went, and he and his men killed not 100 men, but 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins and they gave them in full count to the king that he might become the king's son-in-law. So in other words, David, again, he's got such high regard and esteem for the, for the authority of, of his nation and the fact that God called that person to sit in that throne, even though he knows he's been called to sit in the throne too. David has such high regard that when the king says, go get 100 Philistines, David's like, done. And then he goes out and he gets 200. He does double the work that the king has asked because he sees the value in, in what the king is actually giving him. It's far beyond what the king is asking. And so David comes back and he gives double the amount because he's so reverent and he's so revered and he, he, looks, at that, he looks at the throne as this is established by the Lord. Not this is the man who throws spears at me, but that throne, that throne is gonna lead to the salvation of the world. I can't even get near that. I'm unworthy to come near that. And that's where the reverence is coming for. Now we can go back to, then Saul gave him Michael as his daughter. But Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And here we go again, church, verse 29. And Saul was still more afraid of David. And so Saul became David's enemy continually. He's not just worried about him. He's not just paranoid about him. He's not just fearful of him anymore. Now he's actively his enemy. This is what fear does if we let it take root. It becomes anger. It becomes envy. It becomes this. I wasn't going to say this, but it's popping through my head like crazy right now. But Yoda's not wrong, right? Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. It's the dark side, guys. 
It's true. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't get Frank Oz's voice out of my ear as I was reading that just now. That, anyway, so David brings this in and, and he gets his wife. And Saul says, he sends him out. And it says that in verse 30, then, then the princes of the Philistines, they went out to war. And so it was whenever they went out that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul so that his name became highly esteemed. The thing that David said, I'm so lowly esteemed. Everything that Saul did to stop David only increased his esteem, only brought more character, brought more capabilities to David. Saul ended up being the very method that God would use to refine David's character. The man who has rejected God became a stumbling block, but it wasn't a stumbling block to David. It was a stumbling block to the nation. To David, he was just... Part of his testimony. Something that would refine David to become one of the greatest kings of Israel. And it is true, church. You know, fear does lead to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. And that's, that's true. Jealousy. Jealousy is the root of all of this. And again, jealousy is also rooted in fear. He's got more than I do. What if he takes my stuff? And I want to leave us with this as we kind of come to a closing point. Proverbs 14.30, it says this, a tranquil heart. Think of David. It gives life to the flesh. That's what David did. He would show up with a harp, play a harp, and just by being who he is and with the spirit of God upon him, just by being a tranquil heart in the presence of of, of incredible distress, he could relieve that distress for a time. Proverbs 14.30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. If you're watching, as we read, we are watching Saul rot. There's so little left of who he was. He has become a rotten soul. James 3.16 says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Jealousy, just like fear, is often manifested by anger. And in his jealousy, Saul does all he can to remove David from the equation. And yet all that he does is empower David by giving him the testimony that would make David into King David. Saul and his jealousy actually brings about the thing he fears the most. And that's what jealousy always does. The thing we become jealous of, the person we become jealous of when we try to remove it. If we are operating out of jealousy, if we are operating out of fear, if we are operating out of anger, we tend to empower the very thing that we want to get rid of. And as Christians, we're called to live differently. Not envious, not fearful, not angry, but in fact, we are actually meant to live like David lived. And we can actually do it because like we talked about, the Lord has equipped us with his Holy Spirit, not upon us, but within us from the moment of belief for all eternity. And if we would but trust in him and and lead or or be led by him, then we can live the way that Jesus calls us to live. We, We have the Spirit of God himself within us through his indwelling Holy Spirit. And that allows us to live the way that Christ desires us to live. And how does Christ desire us to live? Let me leave you with this scripture. Romans 12, 9 through 21. And as we read this, think, how do I live? Do I live this way? Not, not as a, just as a barometer, guys. This isn't a try harder, do more, be better message. This is a barometer for us to figure out, are we, are we letting the spirit lead us or are we trying to do this on our own? Let love be without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Think of David there. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome.
by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the kind of life, those are the kind of relationships that we are meant and called to and empowered to live. That's the kind of relationship Jonathan has with David. That's the kind of relationship God wants us to have with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He doesn't want us to live under the bondage and the slavery of anger, jealousy, anxiety, fear. He wants us to live like that. He wants us to live under the freedom of love. I guess I would leave you with one practical thing. If you find yourself prone to fits of anger or or fits of jealousy or, or fits of whatever, you know, maybe when you're there, ask the question, when you feel mad, what am I really afraid of losing here? What am I really afraid of? Am I angry or am I afraid something's about to disappear? Ask that question and then follow it up with this question. Is God bigger than that? When we find the answers to those questions, I think we, through the power of the Holy Spirit, begin to live like this. Let's pray.